6. The One and the Many The Greek approach to the problem of the one and the many rested on this background of a chaos order dialectic set in the context of the continuity concept. Both the early monists and the pluralists accepted this framework. They did not essentially alter the ideas of the original form of things, but they raised the question of centrality. What was wanted was an intellectual Archimedean lever for the universe. The monists first addressed themselves to this question. Thales, Anaximander, and Anaximenes of the Milesian school, Xenophanes of Colophon, Elia, Parmenides and Zeno of the Eleatic school, and Heraclitus at Ephesus. The Milesians assumed, first, one unchanging cosmic substance as the basis of the changes of nature, and second, that moving matter is living matter. Xenophanes dealt with the first premise, as did the Eleatics, while Heraclitus accepted only the second. For Heraclitus, 530 to 470 BC, change is the key and the reality. All things are in process of becoming and are continually in motion, passing away. It is not possible to step twice into the same river. Rest is in change, for all things flow and all things are one. Reality is thus a perpetual becoming, energy in motion. Thus, the sun in size, the breadth of a man's hand, is new each day. Fire steers the universe. Change is the harmonious interaction of opposites as a closed circle, a continuing and continuous dialectic. God is day-night, winter-summer, war-peace, satiety-famine. The dialectical tension is the true God. War is both king of all and father of all, and the hidden harmony is stronger, or better, than the visible. That which is in opposition is in concert, and from things that differ comes the most beautiful harmony. Thus, a dialectical tension and a kind of relativity are basic to Heraclitus. Chaos and order are necessary, one to another, and male to female. This is the tension and motion which constitutes reality. For Parmenides of Alea, 515 to 440 BC, identification of the cosmic substance was the key. This cosmic substance is being, which is the same as thought. For it is the same thing to think and to be. Moreover, one should both say and think that being is, for to be is possible, and nothingness is not possible. Being has no coming into being and no destruction. How could being perish? How could it come into being? Furthermore, being is motionless, and it is spatial, so that being is not only thought, but it is also at the same time matter. Heraclitus eliminated permanence and Parmenides eliminated change. For Heraclitus, there was only process, but the process had a unity, a rhythmical law. To know justice, we must have injustice. All things are relative and hence dialectical. For Parmenides, being is an eternal, finite, motionless and spherical solid body. The famous illustration of Zeno, such as the flying arrow that remained at rest, were designed to demonstrate the truth of Parmenides' system. However naturalistic their presuppositions were, these men were not scientific in their concern, rather it was the theology of politics which concerned them. They were interested in the nature of the cosmos and the key or lever to its government. For Heraclitus, the world is governed by a logos, a reason, a law, and this is the fire itself. According to Plato, Parmenides and Zeno sought to disprove the existence of the many. For him, 
being had to be one and homogeneous. Because of this pantheistic oneness of all being, one can perhaps assume that Parmenides may have been favourable to an equalitarian and democratic order. There is perhaps a curious hint of this in fragment 18. When a woman and a man mix the seeds of love together, the power of the seeds which shapes the embryo in the veins out of different blood can mould well-constituted bodies only if it preserves proportions. For if the powers war with each other, when the seed is mixed, and do not make a unity in the body formed by the mixture, they will terribly harass the growing embryo through the twofold seed of the two sexes. The being of Parmenides was equal throughout, without origin and without a future. Such a being had no future, nor did such a philosophy. The pluralists offered another answer. Empedocles at Argentum or Acragus, Anaxagoras at Clazomenae, the later Pythagoreans at Thebes mainly, and Leucippus at Abdera. The pluralists assumed a permanence which became transposed rather than transformed. For Empedocles, 495 to 435 BC, there were four elements fire, air, water, and earth and strife and love, repulsion and attraction were responsible for change and motion. History is therefore cyclical, as strife and love create first an era in which love reigns and all elements are totally mixed and indistinguishable, second the era in which strife enters in and the elements are separated, although with freakish combinations at times, third, strife triumphs, and the four elements are totally separate, and life, as in the first era, is impossible. Fourth, love invades the separated elemental world, and the resultant mingling again produces life. According to Empedocles in Fragment 8, there is no birth nor death of substances, but only mixing and exchange, and substance is the name applied to the combination. The elements are uncreated. Empedocles thus has a pluralism of elements and a unity of process because of the eternal and continuous tension of love and strife, attraction and repulsion. Love produces a chaos of undifferentiated mixture. Strife produces an order of sterile differentiation. And life is an impossibility under either total chaos or total order. The dialectical tension of the two is a necessity for life. Anaxagoras, 500 to 428 BC, insisted on pluralism, but with a required unity. He refused to limit the number of elements to four, but he also insisted that, in everything there must be everything. It is not possible for them to exist apart but all things contain a portion of everything. According to Warner, he held the view that matter is a continuum, infinitely divisible, and that, however much it may be divided, each part will contain elements of everything else. How could this chaos of matter, infinitely divisible yet continuous, produce anything? To introduce motion, growth and change, Anaxagoras posited a nous or mind as a physical element which is infinite and self-ruling and is mixed with no thing but is alone by itself. Order is thus joined to chaos to make life possible. This dialectical tension of chaos and order or matter and mind, form or idea, continued to assert itself the later Pythagoreans tended to fix this tension into a dualism. Pluralism in the form of atomism ostensibly came into its own with Democritus of Abderk, 460 to 370 BC, who, we are told, interpreted reality mechanically rather than teleologically. In terms of atoms and the void, 
with worlds forming as atoms collide. The result, however, is the same. Relativism and a cyclical teleology is ultimately as relativistic as a mechanical atomism. For Democritus, we know nothing in reality, for truth lies in an abyss. Fragment 117 the facts and truths of men are conventions. Colour exists by convention. Usage. Sweet by convention. Bitter by convention. Fragment 125. This same statement, found also in Fragment 9, continues. Atoms and void alone exist in reality. We know nothing accurately in reality, but only as it changes according to the bodily conditions and the constitution of those things that flow upon the body and impinge upon it. Knowledge is thus, in the main, a knowledge of phenomena. However, according to Fragment 34, man is a universe in little microcosm. Reality then appears to be not only atoms in the void, but also man, the little cosmos, a walking order. Democritus therefore favoured democracy, fragment 251, and his democracy was by implication not only political but also moral, with every man a walking law unto himself. Apparently for Democritus, women were not a microcosm, but perhaps a void. A woman must not practise argument this is dreadful, fragment 110. To be ruled by a woman is the ultimate outrage for a man, fragment 111. The basic reason is that rule belongs by nature to the stronger, fragment 267. The slaves were to be used as parts of the great body, fragment 270. Functionally, and women were also functional in their nature. Man was the social atom, and his desires the social law.